So what we're going to talk about today uh, is new concepts in childhood growth. And I do have two disclosures. Uh, my employer, the NIH, holds patents related to growth plate targeted therapy, and we receive research support from a biotech company for this approach. So what I'd like to do today is discuss with you uh, 10 questions related to childhood growth, starting with this simple question, how do children grow taller? Well, children grow taller because their bones grow longer, and their bones grow longer because of this structure, the growth plate. As you know, the growth plate is a thin layer of cartilage that's found near the ends of children's bones. A closer look shows that the growth plate is composed of three layers, the resting zone, the proliferative zone, and the hypertrophic zone. So how does the growth plate cause bones to grow longer? Well, in the proliferative zone, the chondrocytes are proliferating. And that leads to chondrogenesis, the production of more and more cartilage, which gradually pushes apart the two ends of the bones, causing the bones to grow longer. In addition, farther down in the growth plate, the individual chondrocytes hypertrophy. They physically enlarge, and that also contributes to chondrogenesis and therefore to bone elongation. Now, from this diagram, it would appear that the cartilaginous growth plate is getting thicker and thicker over time. But that does not actually happen because at the very bottom of the growth plate, the newly formed cartilage gets remodeled into bone. And so the net result is that new bone is progressively created at the bottom of the growth plate. And as we said, over time, the bone gets longer and longer. And because this is happening in growth plates throughout the body over time, the child gets taller and taller. So that's our first take home point, that in children, linear growth, height gain, results from growth plate chondrogenesis. And the two clinical corollaries are that all short stature is due to decreased growth plate chondrogenesis, and all tall stature is due to increased growth plate chondrogenesis. Now, with these concepts in mind, we can take on the second question, how is linear growth regulated in children? Well, we said that linear growth results from the action of growth plate chondrocytes. So if we want to know how linear growth is regulated, then we need to know how the growth plate chondrocyte is regulated. Let's focus in then on one growth plate chondrocyte and think about its regulation. Well, growth hormone from the pituitary gland, acting in part through circulating IGF-1, stimulates growth plate chondrocyte proliferation and hypertrophy, speeds up chondrogenesis, speeds up linear growth, and that's the fundamental reason why children with growth hormone deficiency are short, or children with growth hormone insensitivity due to mutations in the growth hormone receptor, or mutations in the gene encoding IGF-1 or the type 1 IGF receptor. Now, thyroid hormone is also required for normal growth plate chondrocyte proliferation and hypertrophy, and so children with hypothyroidism can present to us with short stature. Glucocorticoids in high concentrations negatively regulate growth plate chondrogenesis. And so children with Cushing syndrome may gain a lot of weight, but their linear growth is impaired. Estrogens and androgens stimulate growth and are responsible for the pubertal growth spurt. Now, I remember as a fellow wondering, why did nature bother to put growth under this complex endocrine control? It seemed like it was just asking for trouble, more things to break down. But I think the answer is that growth was placed under this endocrine control to make it responsive to nutrition because for millions of years, our ancestors lived on the edge of starvation. And so there would be a survival advantage to any system that could conserve nutrients in times of famine. During these lean times, the child becomes malnourished. Thyroid hormone levels decline as part of the non-thyroidal illness syndrome. Cortisol levels go up, IGF-1 levels decrease, the reproductive axis gets shut down, and through all these mechanisms, growth is slowed down to conserve nutrients for vital functions. Because growth is something of a luxury, which can be postponed till better times. And as we'll discuss when we come to the topic of catch-up growth, we'll see that growth is primarily just postponed during these adverse times, rather than lost irreversibly. You know, in addition to these endocrine and nutritional regulatory systems, 
There are also circulating pro-inflammatory cytokines, which negatively regulate growth at the growth plate and likely contribute to the poor linear growth we see in children with systemic inflammatory diseases like systemic idiopathic, uh, ju uh, uh, idiopathic juvenile arthritis and Crohn's disease. So we begin to see how the growth plate chondrocyte integrates a wide array of information to set the child's growth rate. And to make matters more interesting, these aren't independent systems regulating growth, but rather a highly interactive network of systems. And I've only tried to diagram here some of the reported interactions. And even this is just the beginning, because so far we've only been talking about the systemic regulation of growth by circulating factors. It turns out that there's even more extensive regulation going on locally within the growth plate itself. There are paracrine factors going back and forth between the chondrocytes. There's regulation by the cartilage extracellular matrix, and there's extensive intracellular regulation occurring within the chondrocytes themselves. Each of these levels of regulation is clinically important. We really need to understand them if we're going to be evaluating children with growth disorders. And so I'd like to step through each of these and give an example or two. So let's start with these paracrine factors. There are many such factors. We'll focus in as our first example on CNP, C-type natriuretic peptide. Well, as we and others have shown, CNP stimulates growth plate chondrogenesis. It does so by acting through its receptor, NPR2. Well, as clinicians, we can take a step back, look at this system, and make a prediction. That loss of function mutations in NPR2 should do what? Well, they should impair chondrogenesis and cause short stature. And sure enough, homozygous loss of function mutations in NPR2 severely impair growth plate chondrogenesis resulting in bones that are short and also malformed, and therefore presenting clinically as a chondrodysplasia, as, oops, sorry. sorry. As, as exemplified by these three sisters in the front row. Heterozygous loss of function mutations, as you might guess, have a milder phenotype because one copy of the gene is still okay. These result in bones that are somewhat short and not malformed. And so they present clinically as idiopathic short stature. When studied, it turns out that about 2% of kids with idiopathic short stature have a mutation in NPR2 as the cause. Only in these kids, we can't call it idiopathic anymore. So let's call it isolated short stature. Now the opposite kind of mutation, gain of function mutations can also occur in this receptor and as you might guess, they have the opposite phenotype, tall stature. Now, to see a variation on this theme, we can turn to another set of paracrine factors, the FGFs, the fibroblast growth factors. As we and others have shown, the FGFs have the opposite effect from CNP. FGFs inhibit chondrogenesis. They do that by acting through FGF receptor 3. So in this case, we would predict that a gain of function mutation, an activating mutation in FGR3, would cause excessive inhibition of chondrogenesis and therefore short stature. And sure enough, gain of function mutations in FGFR3 can cause hypochondroplasia, achondroplasia, which is depicted here, or thanatophoric dysplasia, depending on the severity of the mutation. There's been a report suggesting that mild gain of function mutations can present as isolated short stature. Now, the opposite kind of mutation can also occur, loss of function mutations, and you can probably guess the phenotype. It's tall stature, tall stature with scoliosis. Okay, let's move on from the paracrine factors to the extracellular matrix. And here I just wanna give one example. It's a proteoglycan called agrocan. And agrocan is an important component of the cartilage matrix. And so homozygous mutations cause a severe skeletal dysplasia. Heterozygous mutations can present as isolated short stature, as shown by Ola Nielsen in our group uh, in a collaboration with Andrew Dauber and others. It's not actually completely isolated because these patients have a tendency to early onset osteoarthritis and degenerative disc disease. Well, why is that? 
We said that agrican is an important component of the growth plate cartilage matrix, and that explains the short stature. Agrican is also an important component of the articular cartilage and the vertebral disc cartilage matrix, explaining the joint disease. Okay, let's move on to the intracellular regulation of growth. And we can start with a gene that you all probably know well, SHOX, short stature homeobox containing gene. It encodes a transcription factor that's important in the growth plate. And so homozygous loss of function mutations cause a skeletal dysplasia. Heterozygous loss of function mutations can present as isolated short stature. This is all work done by Gudrun Rapol. Now, as you probably know, there's a copy of SHOX on the X chromosome and another copy on the Y chromosome. And so normal boys, XY, have two copies of SHOX. Normal girls, XX, also have two copies of SHOX. And interestingly, SHOX is one of those genes that escapes X inactivation. And so normal girls have two active copies of SHOX. But girls with Turner syndrome, who have only one copy, X, copy of the X chromosome, have only one copy of SHOX. And so they're short. Now, SHOX doesn't explain all their many other features, which are related to other genes on the X chromosome. Boys with Klinefelter syndrome, XXY, have three copies of SHOX, and they're tall. Okay, now there are a lot of intracellular regulatory systems we could talk about, but let me, let me just mention one that I find particularly interesting and we've been studying. And it starts with this patient whom we saw in a clinic. He's uh, very tall, as you can see by these uh, purple marks here. His parents are, were not particularly tall. He had an advanced bone age. We did exome sequencing on him, and it turned out that he had Weaver syndrome. And Weaver syndrome is an overgrowth syndrome that involves epigenetic mechanisms. So to understand the syndrome, we have to remember that our DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones. And those proteins, those histones, can undergo post-translational modifications, such as methylation. And those uh, uh, post-translational modifications modulate local gene expression. Well, Weaver syndrome is due to mutations, partial loss of function mutations in EZH2, which encodes an enzyme that methylates histone 3 at one particular lysine residue. And that tends to silence local gene expression. Now, Weaver syndrome, the, the full phenotype, it, we said it has tall stature. They're often LGA at birth. Uh, they have an advanced bone age, tend to have a large head, often cognitive impairment, and uh, though it's mild, and uh, typical faces. Well, very similar syndrome that you probably are familiar with, Soto syndrome, is due to mutations in NSD1, which encodes an enzyme that methylates histone 3 at a different lysine residue. And then a, a similar syndrome is due to mutations in DNMT3A, which methylates not the histones, but the DNA itself. Now, all of these so far are epigenetic writers. They write marks onto the chromatin. We very recently found another gene that causes a similar overgrowth syndrome, and this one turns out to be an epigenetic reader. It reads those marks to affect downstream uh, cellular events. And we're going to present that at the uh, Endocrine Society meeting this year. Okay, but the big take home point here is that growth plate chondrogenesis is the final common pathway through which many systems regulate linear growth. And the corollary is that the primary genetic defects responsible for short and tall stature lie scattered throughout these many regulatory systems. Now, so far, we've been talking about short stature that has a monogenic inheritance, where it's really just one gene that causes the short stature. For some genes, it's a dominant inheritance. For other genes, it's a recessive inheritance. But as you well know, many families that come to us in clinic don't show either of these two simple Mendelian patterns. Instead, maybe everybody in the family is somewhat short to one degree or another. And we think this is an oligogenic or polygenic inheritance where it's a combination of genes which adds up to the short stature. Well, clinically, it's helpful to try and figure out whether your patient has a monogenic inheritance or polygenic inheritance. Because if it's a monogenic inheritance, well, then we might be able to send the DNA for genetic tests 
and find the gene that's responsible. And sometimes that gene, finding that gene has other health implications. When I was a fellow, I was taught to characterize short stature as either familial or non-familial, where only the one child is affected. But actually, I don't think this helps us get at the etiology because familial lumps together monogenic and polygenic causes, which we want to distinguish. And non-familial, well, it could be a recessive inheritance and just by chance, none of the other siblings inherited the same two alleles. Or it could be a dominant inheritance, but the mutation occurred de novo, so it's not present in either parent. So the take home point here is that short stature can be monogenic or oligopolygenic, we wanna know which. And the corollaries are that this Traditional distinction between familial and non-familial short stature doesn't get us very far. Instead, what we want to do is take an extended family history, aunts, uncles, grandparents, find out the heights as best we can, draw out a pedigree, and see whether it looks like a dominant pattern, a recessive pattern, or a polygenic pattern. Now, I admit, and you, and you already know, that sometimes we can't make this distinction with certainty. You know, one reason is that shorter people tend to marry other shorter people, and that sort of thing can confuse us. But very often, we can make this distinction with pretty good confidence, and then it's very helpful in the subsequent workup. Okay, we can next ask ourselves this question, what are the genes responsible for polygenic short stature? Well, it's generally thought that polygenic short stature is just the tail end of the normal height distribution. So if we want to know the genes responsible for polygenic short stature, we need to know the genes responsible for the normal height distribution. So that's our next question. Why does height vary among normal individuals? Why are some normal people taller than others? And wonderful insights into this question have come from genome-wide association studies. Many of these led by Joel Hirshhorn at Boston Children's. In these studies, they looked for single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, that are associated with adult height. And they really succeeded. In their most recent publication, they've identified now more than 7,000 loci scattered throughout the genome that are associated with height. Now, in each locus, there's usually several genes, and, and we don't know for sure often which one of those genes is really causative and which others are just innocent neighbors. But bioinformatic analysis has suggests that the genes that are responsible for, uh, for modulating growth within the normal height within the normal range are the same kinds of genes that we've been talking about, genes that regulate growth plate chondrogenesis at multiple different levels. So the take home point here is that for genes that regulate the growth plate, sequence variants can cause a broad phenotypic spectrum. For example, if a gene positively regulates growth plate chondrogenesis, then homozygous loss of function mutations can cause a skeletal dysplasia. We've seen several examples already. Heterozygous loss of function mutations can present as monogenic isolated short stature, as we've discussed. Doesn't have to be this pattern. Sometimes, depending on the gene, a heter heterozygous mutations are enough to cause a skeletal dysplasia. Or for other genes, homozygous mutations are required just to get isolated short stature. And then mild polymorphisms in these very same genes contribute to polygenic short stature and normal stature and polygenic tall stature. And for a few of these genes, gain of function mutations can cause monogenic tall stature. Okay, let's switch gears a bit and ask this question. Why does linear growth stop? Why aren't you and I still growing taller? And we can gain insight into this question just by looking at how the normal growth rate, the change in height per year, how that growth rate changes with age. And we can see right away that growth does not just suddenly stop abruptly at 16 years of age, but instead the growth rate gradually decreases throughout childhood, starting before birth, because the human fetus grows at an enormous rate more than 100 centimeters per year in body length. But by birth, that growth rate has fallen to 50 centimeters per year. By mid-childhood, it's way down to five centimeters per year. That decline in the growth rate is briefly interrupted by the pubertal growth spurt, but then it resumes and growth stops. 
Now, as endocrinologists, we might guess that growth slows down because of some systemic mechanism, like a change in a hormone level. But actually, the evidence suggests otherwise. And, and that evidence comes from experiments in which growth plates were transplanted between animals of different ages. And it turned out that the growth rate of the transplanted growth plates depended on the age of the donor animal, not the recipient. That implies that this slowing in growth is not due to a systemic mechanism, which would be a property of the recipient, but rather to local mechanisms in the growth plates themselves, which therefore transfer when you do a transplantation. And we've come to term these local mechanisms growth plate senescence, which is just a fancy word for aging. So what we're saying is that as the child goes gets older, the growth plates undergo functional senescence, causing the growth rate to slow down. That slowing in growth <clears throat> turns out to be primarily due to a decrease in the rate of chondrocyte proliferation. In addition to these functional senescent changes, the growth plate also undergoes with age structural senescent changes. The overall height of the growth plate decreases because of a decrease in the number of cells in, in every zone. The growth plate involutes with age. Underlying these functional and structural senescent changes are molecular senescent changes, which we've studied. There's a complex developmental genetic program, which involves a large set of growth-promoting genes that are highly expressed in early life, causing rapid growth. But then these growth-promoting genes are downregulated, causing growth to slow with age. Now we can next ask ourselves, what ultimately drives this developmental program of senescence? Is it driven by time per se? A biological clock that's ticking off the weeks and months and years causing these senescent changes? Or instead, might senescence be driven by growth? Something like a cell cycle counter that's keeping track of how many times the chondrocytes have divided and using that information to advance the senescence program. Well, to make this distinction, we decided to slow down growth in the growth plates and ask whether or not that would slow down senescence, whether it would slow down aging of the growth plates. We've now done this in three animal models involving hypothyroidism, glucocorticoid excess, and malnutrition. And in every case, when we slow down growth, we slow down senescence. We slow down aging of the growth plates. So it's as though the growth plates in some way have a limited ability to, to grow, that the chondrocytes can proliferate a, a, a long time, but they can't keep proliferating forever. Ever. And as they gradually use up their growth capacity, growth slows down and slows down and stops. Okay, now in laboratory animals, the way we study senescence is we can dissect out growth plates, look at them under the microscope, extract RNA. Well, in children, of course, we can't do those things. But we can take x-rays of growth plates. And in fact, when we're evaluating a child for a growth disorder, we very often obtain a radiograph of the left hand and wrist. We compare that image to an atlas. And then we assign the child a bone age. We use that bone age to help predict the child's adult height. Why does that work? Why is the bone age useful for adult height prediction? Well, I think based on the concepts we've been discussing, that the bone age is a radiological marker for growth plate senescence. Not, not a perfect marker, but a pretty good marker. And so if we know a child's bone age, we know approximately how far he or she is along in the senescence program, and therefore approximately how much of his or her growth potential has been used up in the growth plates, how much growth potential remains, and therefore it helps us predict the adult height. Now, with these concepts, we can address the fifth question, why does catch-up growth occur? And I know you've all seen catch-up growth in your patients. It was first described by two of the fathers of pediatric endocrinology, Andrea Prater and James Tanner. They showed as one example, this growth chart of a little girl who had an adrenal tumor, which was overproducing cortisol. Well, as you well know, cortisol is a glucocorticoid. And as we said at the beginning of the talk, glucocorticoids inhibit growth plate chondrocyte proliferation. So as a result, her linear growth rate was poor until four years of age. When the tumor 
was surgically removed, the cortisol levels came back down. And interestingly, her growth rate didn't just normalize, which would have produced a growth curve parallel to the normal percentile curves. Instead, her growth rate exceeded normal, causing her height to climb back up into the normal range. Well, Prater and Tanner termed this phenomenon catch-up growth, and they showed examples of its occurrence not only after glucocorticoid excess, but also after hypothyroidism, when we begin treatment, after growth hormone deficiency, after malnutrition, after any condition that transiently inhibits growth. Now, Professor Tanner went on to propose one possible explanation for catch-up growth. He hypothesized that catch-up growth might be due to a mechanism in the central nervous system, which is sensing the child's actual body size through some circulating factors. And then this mechanism might compare that actual body size to an age-appropriate set point and adjust the growth rate accordingly through growth hormone or other factors. So if a child is too small for age, the mechanism would sense this and turn up the growth rate, causing catch-up growth. Well, this neuroendocrine hypothesis was proposed now 60 years ago. And for decades, it was repeated in the literature as the most likely cause for catch-up growth. But there's never any real evidence supporting that hypothesis. And to the contrary, we found some evidence that wasn't readily explained by this neuroendocrine hypothesis. We used miniature osmotic pumps to infuse dexamethasone directly into specific growth plates in growing rabbits. Well, as you know, dexamethasone is another glucocorticoid, and so we slow down growth, but just in the treated growth plates. We did that for four weeks, and then we stopped the infusions. And we found that this local slowing in growth was followed by local catch-up growth just in the previously treated growth plates. Well, that sort of anatomic specificity, that local catch-up growth cannot be explained by the neuroendocrine hypothesis or by any systemic mechanism which involves circulating factors that would have affected all the growth plates equally. And it instead suggests that catch-up growth arises at least in part from mechanisms intrinsic to the growth plate. Okay, so the mechanisms are not in the brain, they're in the growth plate. All right, but then we have to ask ourselves, how did the growth plates get so smart? And I think the answer has to do with senescence. We said that senescence is driven not by time, but by growth. And therefore, when we slow down growth in the growth plates, we slow down senescence. We slow down aging. Now imagine that a growth inhibiting condition resolves. What will happen? The growth plates will be left less senescent than normal. So they'll behave like younger, more robust growth plates, and they'll grow more rapidly than normal, causing catch-up growth. And we have evidence for this mechanism in these three animal models I discussed. And we also have indirect evidence that's at least consistent with this hypothesis in children. And that evidence comes from a collaborative study with uh, Joy Siemens and Jan Martin Witt in the Netherlands. They had studied 28 children with celiac disease, average age 3.9 years. The children were placed on a gluten-free diet, and then their growth was followed prospectively over four years. And these children showed catch-up growth, meaning that their growth rate was greater than normal for their chronological age. But when we went back and mathematically analyzed the growth patterns, we found that their growth rate was normal for a younger child. How much younger? Well, based on the initial bone age. So if a child at diagnosis had a chronological age of four years, but a bone age of only three years, that child would then grow rapidly for a four-year-old, but normally for a three-year-old. And because we consider the bone age to be a marker for senescence, we think these data are consistent with the hypothesis that catch-up growth results, at least in part, from delayed growth plate senescence. Okay, next question. What causes a pipsial fusion? Now, we've all seen this in our patients. At adolescence, around the time of sexual maturation, the growth plates disappear. The cartilage gets replaced by bone. Here's what it looks like in a, a rabbit. Uh, just prior to fusion, we see these beautiful columns of growth plate chondrocytes. They look like a stack of pancakes. 
and they're surrounded by light blue staining cartilage matrix. Shortly after fusion is initiated, the chondrocytes are gone, and the light blue staining cartilage matrix is getting replaced by dark blue staining bone matrix. Well, we wanted to know the mechanism, so we turned to an animal model. There's not time to go through the uh, data, so I'm gonna fast forward to the conclusions. We've already said that growth plate senescence causes chondrocyte proliferation to slow down and slow down, and eventually it stops. That appears to be the trigger which initiates epiphyseal fusion. So the growth plate chondrocytes can divide many times, but they can't keep dividing forever. And when they finally exhaust their proliferative capacity and stop dividing, the growth plate isn't growing anymore. It's non-functional. And that useless piece of cartilage gets remodeled into bone. Well, I think this is kind of interesting because we tell our patients and we tell ourselves that growth stops because of epiphyseal fusion. But actually, it's the other way around. Epiphyseal fusion occurs because growth stops. And that is not just true in rabbits, which we studied, but also it appears to be true in humans. There was a study done back in 1958 where the investigators just took serial x-rays of the hands of adolescents. And they found that the growth of the phalanges stopped about three months before the earliest radiographic signs of epiphyseal fusion. Now, you know from clinical experience and from clinical studies that estrogen promotes epiphyseal fusion. Premature exposure to estrogen causes premature fusion, for example, in children with precocious puberty, whereas delayed exposure to estrogen causes delayed fusion, for example, in adolescents with hypogonadism or estrogen deficiency or estrogen resistance. Again, we wanted to know the underlying mechanisms. And again, we turned to an animal model. And again, I'm going to fast forward to the conclusions. So we've said already that growth plate senescence causes proliferation to slow and stop. That appears to be the trigger that initiates fusion. It turned out that estrogen accelerates growth plate senescence. It speeds up aging of the growth plate, causing proliferation to stop earlier and therefore fusion to occur sooner. Now, uh, I think this uh, concept helps explain a number of phenomena that were, that were previously mysterious. For example, there's this clinical observation that in girls with precocious puberty, of course, at first their growth rate is high because they're having an early pubertal growth spurt. And then when we come in and treat with a GnRH agonist, their growth rate doesn't just come back down to normal, it goes below normal. And there've been a number of studies trying to understand why these children don't grow well. Some of the studies have looked at growth hormone levels, IGF-1 levels, estrogen levels. There's no evident hormonal explanation. But the answer appears to be that prior to treatment, the high estrogen levels accelerated growth plate senescence. They sped up aging of the growth plate. So yes, we can come in with our GNA, GnRH agonist. We can fix all the hormones, but in a sense, the damage has already been done. The growth plates are overly senescent, and so they're not going to grow normally. We have evidence for this uh, explanation, and that evidence comes from a study done by uh, one of my mentors at the NIH, Gordon Cutler, when he was pioneering the use of GnRH agonists to treat precocious puberty. So we look back at his data uh, uh, of a hundred, uh, it was a study of a, about a hundred girls with central precocious puberty who were placed on GnRH agonist. And we looked at their growth rate on agonist and found that that growth rate was very tightly explained by the girl's bone age. So the girls who had only a mildly advanced bone age, well, they grew pretty well. But the girls who had a severely advanced bone age, those were the girls who grew poorly. And because the bone age, we said, is a radiological marker for senescence, we think these, this, th these data support this uh, hypothesis. So here's our big take home point from this part of the talk, that senescence proceeds until proliferation stops, that triggers fusion. The corollaries are that estrogen speeds up senescence causing proliferation to stop sooner, causing earlier fusion. Growth inhibiting conditions, we said before, slow down senescence. So we would expect proliferation to stop later and fusion to occur later. I didn't show you those data, but you're pro you've probably seen this in your patients. If a growth inhibiting condition resolves, 
then the growth plates are less senescent than normal, resulting in catch-up growth. If an estrogen exposure resolves, the growth plates are overly senescent, resulting in catch-down growth. We can think of that poor growth on GNRH agonist as catch-down growth. Okay, now a couple of quick, fun questions. Uh, why are our femurs longer than our phalanges? There's like a 20-fold difference in length. How does nature achieve that difference? Well, we've looked in mice and rats and found that the short bones, like the phalanges, undergo senescence earlier than the longer bones, like the femurs. So the growth rate drops sooner, growth stops earlier, and the bones are shorter. Why are elephants larger than mice? We all know there's a tremendous difference in body size. The actual skeletal structures are very similar in shape, but constructed on vastly different scales. So how does nature achieve this difference? Well, we haven't studied elephants, but we've studied mice and rats and found that in the mouse, the growth plate senescence occurs earlier than in the rat. What about other tissues? So far, we've only been talking about these growth of the skeleton. What about the heart, the liver, the kidney, the lungs? Well, we have studied these other tissues as well and found that they obey similar principles to the growth plate in that they grow rapidly in early life, then slow down and stop. Your kidney and my kidney aren't growing larger anymore. That slowing in growth is due to a complex developmental genetic program. That genetic program is driven by growth, not by time. That's why other organs can undergo catch-up growth. And this developmental genetic program has been modulated through evolution so that it plays out more slowly, say in a sheep kidney, which we've studied, compared to a mouse kidney, allowing the sheep kidney to grow for a longer period of time and end up much larger. Okay, so you may be thinking that some of these last questions are not so clinically relevant you know, femurs, phalanges, elephants, mice. But I like to think, or, or I like to hope that in the long run, they will be clinically relevant. Because if we can really understand why a newborn infant grows 10 times as fast as a school-aged child, why his or her femurs will grow 20 times as large as the phalanges, why an elephant's bones will grow 80 times as large as those of a mice, if we can really understand the potent fundamental mechanisms controlling skeletal growth, then I hope that someday we're going to be able to really treat short stature, not just the easy cases, but the difficult cases who need our help the most. And so that brings us to our last question, how can we treat linear growth disorders more effectively? Well, we thought to ourselves, Linear growth occurs at the growth plate. So wouldn't it be great if we could somehow target our therapies specifically to the growth plate? So with this goal in mind, we developed cartilage binding antibody fragments. We thought we could link them to factors that speed up chondrogenesis. Then we might inject them subcutaneously, they'd circulate, they'd bind to the growth plate cartilage, set up a local depot there, and the goals would be to increase treatment efficacy on bone growth while reducing the adverse effects on other tissues. Well, we've done this now with IGF-1. So as you all know, IGF-1 can be used as a drug, just systemically by itself, and it does promote chondrogenesis, speeds up growth, but it has a lot of adverse effects on other tissues. And so if we could target it specifically to the growth plate, it might be a much better drug. So Julian Louis in our group, he engineered a variety of fusion proteins, we selected the best ones in vitro. And then for the two very best ones, we injected them in mice. These were growth hormone deficient mice. We were trying to restore the local IGF-1 in their growth plates. And so we gave these mice daily injections of fusion proteins for five days. And we found that the two fusion proteins shown in orange and red increased growth plate height, which was our measure of efficacy. And that was not seen with the uh, appropriate negative controls. And so we conclude that this is preliminary proof of principle that targeted therapy can increase on-target efficacy at the growth plate, and in data I didn't show you, decrease off-target adverse effects. Okay, so we've come to the end of our 10 questions, and I hope you've enjoyed your guided tour through the growth plate. For me, 
the overall take home point is that if we want to understand childhood growth, and if we want to understand the individual child who comes to our clinic with a growth disorder, it's very helpful to think in terms of the growth rate. And then finally, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge and thank all the people who've done this work in the lab over the years, many of whom have moved on to uh, better things, and also thank our, some of our uh, great collaborators, and this is just a, a partial list. And then I, I want to thank you for your attention. And I guess I won't be able, I'm not sure if you're set up for questions, like I can't hear uh, anything from, from, from you, but I guess if you, if, if you want, uh, and it's allowed, if the, uh, you could uh, ask me questions in the chat, those people who are online or, or not, I guess we're near the end of the hour anyway. And again, I'm not gonna hear <laughs> even the answer to that question. Ah, okay, so I do see a question in the chat. So it says, anything other than IGF-1 being tried at the growth plate? And yeah, there is. I'm, I, don't, I don't know if I should give away all our secrets. Uh, and, and you can probably guess uh, the kinds of things that, uh, that we'd be interested in. Uh, one of them is actually, you can think, is actually growth hormone. Because as we discussed, growth hormone has a direct effect on the growth plate in addition to its effect through IGF-1. Another thing we've, we, we're working on is, uh, is CNP because as we said, it stimulates growth. One, two. Um, oh, can you hear us now? Oh, now I can hear you. Breakthrough. Awesome, that's great. Um, well, I'm, uh, so we're going to moderate both in-person questions as well as uh, doing uh, virtual questions here. Let me, let's see, can I get to the chat or the Q&A here? Sorry. Um, while we're waiting, though, I, you know, this is a really intriguing, this is Dr. Steelman, by the way, thank you so much. That was a very interesting talk that you did. And, you know, a different way to sort of think about the growth plates than I really had thought about. Um, I was curious, though, you'd, you'd kind of touched on this with IGF-1, but what is it about the properties of growth hormone and, and IGF-1? How do they, do they have some direct way of altering the senescent cycle, or is it more that they simply allow for more proliferation? What's kind of their their positive effect on growth? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and um, you know, I think there's evidence for both an effect on proliferation and on hypertrophy. And I think probably underlying your question is like, how do they, you know, how do they increase the actual adult height? How do they increase the total growth? Uh, why don't they just you know, cause growth to happen more quickly, but, but stop sooner and, and you end up the same height? And I, I think we don't really know fully the answer, but I think part of it may be their effect on hypertrophy. Because if you make the chondrocytes hypertrophy more, then you get more growth for every time the chondrocytes divide and, and for every time the stem cells divide. And so you get sort of more bang for your buck. You, 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 and, and that would be a, at least a theoretical way to get more growth out of the same number of, of stem cell divisions. And I didn't talk about the stem cells, but the stem cells are actually up in the resting zone, the very top of the growth plate, uh, as, as we and others have, have shown. And it's probably there that senescence is, is really controlled by how many times uh, those cells can divide before they, those stem cells are depleted. Okay. Okay, I think we have one question here in the room. Did you have one? Yeah. Um, you mentioned methylation with Weaver syndrome. And I wonder if you um, think it would be reasonable to look at people that have a, I think it's an MTFHR gene and the methylation that can come to them from environmental sources, like say being exposed to natural gas in their home too much or something like that. Is it reasonable to look at how that might be affecting some of these syndromes and if that's part of the methylation that's causing problems? 
Yeah, I think that's a wonderfully interesting question. You know, that uh, right there, as you point out, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that um, that methylation of DNA, I think, is where most of the work has been done, but presumably also histone methylation, you know, is not just all genetically programmed, that it can be affected by uh, environment, you know, by early feeding, those sort of things. And that might be a mechanism that's, uh, you know, regulating regulating growth and interacting with these genetic abnormalities that, that affect uh, epigenetic mechanisms. So yeah, I think that's that's a great area uh, open for, for study, but, but I don't think there's, there's much known about it. Do we have any other questions in the room? Um, I had one other question for you. So um, as far as the, you'd mentioned about the genetics, I mean, I think most of us understand or just, you know, a little bit overwhelmed by the, the vast number of genes that regulate growth, but are there any particular genes, you know, outside of the polygenic ones that you had mentioned that seem to be, you know, factors on growth that you are excited about as possible future targets? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I actually think that a lot of our favorite targets I kind of showed, and that's maybe, you know, that was my bias in putting the talk together. So, um, so the kinds of targets, so CNP, I think, and NPR2 is a great target, and we're working hard on that. And, and you know, as you know, there's al already uh, CNP agonists that are being tried for achondroplasia, and, and with some success. And, and I guess you, you have at least one talk uh, coming up on, on that tomorrow. Um, and then FGFR3, I think, is a great uh, other target. Um, you know, so CNP actually indirectly affects FGFR3 signaling. So that's, that's why it works for achondroplasia. Um, but FGFR3 itself, uh, that signaling pathway uh, can potentially be targeted. And, uh, and we and others are interested in, in that approach too. Uh, and, and you can imagine that these sort of approaches can be used to treat specifically disorders that, you know, involve those pathways, you know, so, uh, you know, you might, if you're targeting FGFR3, you say, well, uh, maybe that's going to be great for achondroplasia, but, you know, it also might be good as a general stimulant to growth because, you know, as we said, if you have loss of function mutations in FGFR3, those people get very tall. So it's possible you could speed up growth kind of uh, in any condition, sort of like growth hormone. Uh, if you could uh, say, um, you know, block FGFR3 signaling or increase CNP signaling. We have one more time for one more on the floor. I think we have time for one more question and then okay. we'll, we'll wrap up here. Hi, that was a fabulous talk. Um, it, this is a simplistic question, but is there a role for developing a gene panel chip? for genetic testing with all the struggles we have to get genes tested, similar to what we do for Modi and some of the early onset obesity types of scenarios? Yeah, I think there, there are gene panels. They're getting better and better. And I think that it won't be very long before we're all doing probably exome sequencing. Uh, as, and, 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 you know, the problem, you, I'm sure you know about this, you know, the problem with exome sequencing is you sometimes get back results that you don't know how to interpret because we often don't, we don't know all the genes that control growth and we don't know within a, a gene that you, we do know control of growth. We often don't know if a particular variant, which we find is, is really important or not. Uh, but that information is steadily growing. And so I think that it won't be long before we're going to be doing kind of exome sequencing in in, in our patients who, not everybody who walks in at the third percentile, but in patients who have sort of important unexplained short stature.